Thank you very much. All right, so we will be taking your questions in a bit. And uh, I guess I'll be going with the very first question whilst we get you to prepare to have your questions. We have some people sending their questions already. So you can also send your questions to www.su.vc slash askmd. And uh, we will be putting those questions to Madame Lagarde. Now, we would have some ushers who are going to be in the middle and they will be holding their microphones. So immediately I pick you to ask a question then they will get a microphone to you. <clears throat> All right. So I I want to uh, go with the very first question and I'm sure it's, it's a question like that, that isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure it's a question that's on the minds of lots of people which is the fact that we're exiting the IMF. So what is going to be the relationship between Ghana and the IMF going forward? It will be a combination of two things. One, it will be the normal relationship that we have with any country uh, which is a member of the IMF, and there are 189 members of the institution, uh, and that requires, because that's the contract that was entered into between the 189 countries, that annually we conduct an audit of the economy, we review the fiscal position, we review the debt position, we review the underlying fundamentals about it, we focus on anything that is macro-critical. And I take the opportunity of, of this to mention that there are countries where female participation to the labor market or access to finance are macro-critical. We will in that case review those issues. There are countries where the level of inequalities is such that it is macro-critical and can actually impair the proper functioning of the economy, we will look into it. There are countries where climate change risks and challenges are also macro-critical and are sometimes a survival issue, and that will also be included in our review. So that's you know, the, the normal relationship which is mandatory, which has been agreed between the members and that we conduct, it's called Article 4, because it's under the articles of the IMF that were signed in 1945, it's the principle that the countries agreed. So that's the mandatory part. Now, we are also available to help with anything that the country wants, Ghana and others, and whether it takes the form of technical assistance, of training, of particular uh, monitoring of certain aspects, a, a follow-up program, I don't think that's necessarily uh, in the cards, but anything that Ghana would want, would, would, would welcome and would see useful, we'll try everything we can to accommodate that request. I know that there has been a lot of technical assistance and uh, you know, we, we, we would, would be happy to continue providing such in order to build the institutional capacity because you know, it's all very well to have good principles, good laws, very good ministers uh, in the economic and financial fields, central bank governors of superb quality, but if they don't have the bench, you, know, you like football in this country, I like football too. You have the key players in the field, but you need to have a very deep bench in order to constantly you know, develop and, and, uh, and deliver. So that, that's something that uh, we can help with. All right, thank you very much. So now I'm ready to take your questions, the questions from the floor. All right. Um, do I have, all right, I have a gentleman there in the blue shirt. Let's get a, a microphone to him. Should keep his hand on because people... Yes, so keep your finger up. Okay, so the microphone will get to you. Okay, in a bit. And we'll also be taking some questions. They're going to pop up on the screen and we're going to be sharing that. So. Mention, give us your name and uh, the institution you're coming from, and then you ask your question, please. Okay, my name is John Andrew Richardson. I'm coming from the University of Ghana. Over the years, one thing I have realized is that um, IMF MDs normally complement um, governments in power for their economic management, but then when they go to a position, IMF also paints a gloomy picture of their economic management. So why, why is it that? Because I've realized that from 1992 up to date, IMF has been consistent with that. Thank you. 
All right, we'll take a, a second question with a gentleman who's in the uh, suit right there. You raise your hand. Is it that you're not going to ask a question anymore? Sorry, can I, can I, I'm not sure that I understood the distinction that you drew between the two roles that we played. I, I want to give you the best answer I can, so I need to understand the question better. Sorry. Okay. Right, to clarify. Okay. And what I'm saying is that, you know, currently, um, when you met with the vice president, you said that the economy is performing better than two years, yep. all right? And I said, that has been the case, all right? Whenever um, successive governments are in power, or when a government is in power, and then the IMF wants to comment about the economy, that prevails at the time. They, they always commend them for, the, for their powerful e economic management, all right? But when they go off power, IMF paints a gloomy picture of the um, government that lost power. I, I believe you understand me now. Okay. All right, maybe I, yeah. let me just yeah, summarize. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So essentially, his point is that you say, you always say nice yeah, things yeah, yeah. about the government in power. All right, so let's have the second question. Uh, thank you very much for the opportunity. I'm Dr. Lord Mensa I'm from University of Ghana Business School. Um, I'd wanted to know, after, I think we're about to exit the program, and um, looking at the dynamics, I want to ask if in case Ghana should go back to IMF, you know, would the conditions be stronger than what we had this time? And if that is the case, what are you telling our leaders, you know, going forward in exiting this program? Hmm. Should right. I take these two? Yes. Yeah. So we can, okay. we can, we t we'll take two and then we'll come back. Okay. So please hold on for us. We'll take the two and then we'll come back and take some more. You know, on, on your first question, um, first of all, I think I've, I've, I tried to be uh, fair in praising certain aspects, and you applauded, and then in identifying the vulnerabilities, uh, which nobody applauded. <laughs> so we tried as much as we can to have a balanced view about the policies and what they deliver. And I think I would have done the same thing two years back and four years before and on and on. We have to work with whatever regime is in place. And in many ways, I wouldn't say the beauty of the IMF, but we try to extract ourselves from the politics. And we try to look at the data, the prospect, the potential, the likely policy impact of um, decisions. We have to look at the external environment. Uh, I mean, there are so many factors that we have to look at, irrespective of political leadership and side, if you will. But there is one thing which is critically important for any program anywhere in the world to succeed, and that is political ownership. I'm still to see a program well designed, fully grounded in the right, or, you know, the best analysis that we produce, which will succeed if it doesn't have the ownership by the authorities whose ultimate responsibility is to produce the results. You know, I was a finance minister in France, and whenever something was difficult in any of the European countries, not all, but many, Whenever something was difficult, we used to say, ah, it's because of Brussels. You pass the buck. Very often, I feel like I'm Brussels. But it doesn't work. It's only going to work when the country, represented by its authorities, takes ownership of the measures that are needed to improve the position, to reestablish a balance of payment that works to build up the reserves, to have a monetary policy that is predictable, stable, and well articulated, and that will provide stability, to establish the fiscal responsibility that is needed, to limit the borrowing, cap it as suggested, cap it in terms of fiscal deficit as suggested. So that's the political side that I see very often. Now, another IMF program, would that be needed you know, you know your country better than I do. It seems to me on the face of it, particularly if 
the resolve that I have heard from the president, from the vice presidents, from the finance minister, from the governor, if there is that resolve to actually stay the course and maintain that fiscal discipline, I think the country has everything it takes to do without an IMF program. And I very much hope that there will not be these external shocks, you know, whether it takes, you know, a, a, a sharp drop and durable, sharp and durable drop in commodity prices or massive increases in, in tensions that would hamper any trade. I hope that that doesn't happen because if it did, then clearly not just Ghana, but quite a few countries would actually need our help. And we stand ready. We need to be available and ready for that. But I think, you know, in addition to political maturity, I think that fiscal responsibility can be developed and it requires buying and it requires explaining. But I think it is in, in, it's in the seeds of that tree that you are nurturing. Right. So we're going to be taking, uh, if we have any of the questions that are on the screen, uh, we would take uh, some of them. All right. Oh, so, they're upside down. Okay, it's actually upside down. I, I hope we can get to flip it so we can get to see the question. But whilst we get that ready, I'd also want to find out, is it the case that the IMF gets a lot more critical when you're behind closed doors with the government? Of course. You know, I'm honest here. There are certain things um, that we have to really dissect and articulate and, and drill down, which are not necessarily going to be either of interest or which are going to be so uh, technical that very few people would actually understand them. I can go into a jargonic sentence right now for you that you would not understand, and maybe I wouldn't either for that matter. But that's why I, I have all these bright economists working uh, with me. But yeah, there are things that are far more detailed, that are far more um, uh, boring, if you will, that we have behind closed doors. And, and you know, to give you an example, when, when there is a program in place, a team led by a mission chief will actually spend hours and hours and hours with the authorities, going down the numbers, analyzing the balance sheets, you know, reviewing the terms, trying to measure as, as best as we jointly can the debt sustainability of a country, for instance. But to do that, you need to actually spend a lot of hardworking time, and, and we do that. that. That's part of our job. It's not as if it was, you know, cookie cut and, 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 uh, and taken off the shelf. It's, it's tailor-made, it's c customized to the country, and it's, it's a strong dialogue. Um, Mr. Governor is here, and he can attest to that. We, we, our team has spent many, many evenings and sometimes nights and, and long days of hard work, in addition to his normal daily work, to actually get to the bottom of where is going to be, you know, the, the, the bank restructuring or, 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 or the bailing out that will be needed in order to restore sanity in the banking sector. That's just one example. All right, whilst we wait for the question to pop up, we'll take uh, the other question, yes. Uh, thank you very much. My name is Peter Forte from ISE, University of Ghana. Um, my question is, you know, Ghana faces the lessons business cycle. Um, in the numbers quite impressive in the past two years. 2020, come 2020, our fear is that we might experience some shocks as well. What is IMF doing or will be doing to assist Ghana to overcome this political relations business cycle in terms of fiscal slippages? Thank you. Mm. All right, thank you. We'll take one other question. All right, so there's a, we have a microphone here. All right. Um, it looks like the global... Please, your name. My name is Stephen Amoa Maslok. It looks like the global bodies such as IMF normally um, look at the macro uh, parameters. However, the developing economies such as Ghana 
you realize that our market is basically the defensive type. SMEs occupies about 85, 90%. So I'm, I want to find out whether IMF, they really look into these areas or going forward, they will. They will introduce new paradigm shifts that can directly address our market because they can praise us. But down there, the impact is not there. And the people feel like, oh, the economy is good. The political talk because it doesn't really affect them. So mm. what is IMF doing about mm. that? All right. So you can get ready the rest of your questions uh, whilst Madame Lagarde will take uh, the two yeah. questions we have right now. Okay. You raised the issue of fiscal responsibility going forward. And how can the IMF help? Clearly, when there is a program in place and when there are disbursements coming down the tube on each and every review, it gives us the maximum traction to encourage a country into that fiscal responsibility. When the program is over, or when there is no program, what we have is not the wallet anymore, but the brain and the heart. And what I mean by the, the brain is actually looking at all the numbers, looking at all the fundamentals, identifying and analyzing the decisions that are made or the policies that are considered, and giving our honest assessment of where we see the country going and how sustainable the mechanisms are. Then we publish. So it's, it, that work is done by the mission on a regular basis. The mission comes actually, or we actually have a representative here in Ghana, Albert, who is somewhere with us here, right, right here. So we, we, we have the feeding on the ground. We come, we review, we assess, then we submit the report. The board looks at it, challenges it eventually, approves it, and once that process is over, we publish. And to my knowledge, Ghana has always agreed to publish these annual audits, these Article 4. And it's available for public consumption. So civil society, NGOs, individual citizens can access that and can also use our findings to challenge or to support or to seek understanding of what public spending is going to be dedicated to. So we can do that. And as I said earlier, we, we not can, we have to do it. And we can also provide the technical assistance that is eventually needed if the country wants it. But in a way, we hand over the baton to policymakers and to the society itself. Because as I said, you have to sort of face yourself in the mirror before you face forward, uh, to use my quote of earlier on. Um, this is a question. I was, I was, I was, you know, trade minister for my country and finance minister and economy and industry minister at the same time. So I know exactly what you're talking about. And I know that SMEs are actually the vibrant, the most vibrant economic units when it comes to job creations, when it comes to research, when it comes to development. And they are vital uh, for the, uh, the, 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 the development of, of any country. I think the angle from which we can be most helpful is by looking at uh, the credit channels and the numbers that are reflected in the books of the central banks and that are sort of brought up to the central bank by the various banks that are expected to finance the economy. And when we see that the credit creation is lagging behind and that SMEs do not have access to financing, we can raise our warning and say, watch out. Because if you do not facilitate access to finance for the SMEs, you're going to put a big break on potential growth, and that's going to hurt the country. Our job is to look at those sort of macro numbers, but we know that under those macro numbers, there are thousands of SMEs that need financing, that need a regulatory environment that is predictable and, and safe, and that is going to be business friendly. And I, I certainly hope that uh, that can be the case in Ghana, and we will certainly encourage it. All right, we had one question pop up on the screen. All right, so here we have it. Are African governments underestimating the risk that rising debt levels could pose in the coming year? And will the IMF be willing to step in 
financially help those countries that will struggle with debt distress. So whilst you think about this one... I can respond I right away if you want. All right, Phil, let's go. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, it, it's a huge, big issue. And uh, it's, it doesn't only apply to African governments. It applies to many of the low-income, middle-income, and emerging economies, um, where clearly the level of debt is a big concern of ours. If I give you a few numbers, we have currently 184 trillions of debt. Sovereign, corporate, household. Now those big numbers mean nothing, but just remember, it is 50% more than the overall debt that we had in the world in 2007, when the Lehman Brothers precipitated the great financial crisis that we are still suffering the legacy of. So it is a big burden that many countries carry on their back when they are asked to run, to develop their potential growth, to improve productivity, to create jobs. So first of all, I think, and that's where the IMF can help, we need to understand exactly where debt is, what the terms of those debt are, because the days when debt was predominantly held by Paris Club members are gone. There are many non-Paris Club members that are lenders. You know, it's, we always mention China. It's not just China. It's China and many others who are not Paris Club members. In addition to that, you have a lot of debt that has been issued in the forms of multiple bonds by various low-income, middle-income, and emerging market economies, sometimes with, frankly, um, an attitude by not the issuers, but the facilitators, meaning the banks, that has been quite excessive. And I have in the back of my mind situations where a particular country, not very far from here, would actually need a, a bond issuance of X, and the bank would say, ah, you can take X plus, plus, plus. Now, luckily, the head of that government called me and said, well, what do you think? I said, no, just be careful. You need X, go for X. Yeah, but the bankers are saying that the markets are really hungry. They want paper. They want my yield. So stay away from it, particularly if that debt is issued in US dollars or euros, not in your domestic currency. So all details matter. And I think that the first thing we need to do is to really measure what's out there, who holds what, who are the lenders, what are the terms and conditions. And if debt is not sustainable, and we know today that 40% of low-income countries are already at debt distress or vulnerable to debt distress, distress. Well, measures have to be taken, and we can help in that respect. All right, thank you very much. That question came from Uche Okoronko. So we'll take a couple more questions. All right, so we'll take your question. If we can get him a microphone and uh, any other. <laughs> All right, so then this, this, this is when I asked my 19-year-old daughter, a level 100 student at the University of Ghana Business School, to send me a question. She replied, ask her, can I get a job in the future? And my answer is yes. If you are at Imodsen. <laughs> my answer is yes, because if you have the guts to ask a question, you'll have the guts to either find a job or create your job. All right. And I think the future of work is going to look very different. She's what, 19? Well, let's say in 10 years' time, I don't know how many years of studying the parents will be able to pay, um, but I think the job market will look a lot different, and um, I'm sure she'll get a job. All yes. right. So that, there's this other question. What restrictions and sanctions do the IMF give developing countries that spend unnecessarily to gain power in elections rather than providing infrastructure for growth? We've had this question asked in a different way earlier. What they are, I'll tell you something. Um, and, and, this, and I recognize that this question is not directly pointed at that. But under my leadership at the IMF, and, and before me as well, but certainly I've made a point of being very strict on that. Whenever we see 
that money is spent, whether it's the money you know, uh, that has just been disbursed or any, any uh, of such things, when money is spent in hidden way, off the books, in you know, funny directions and funny purposes, typically we stop any support and we stop any program. And we have done that in the past and we would only resume our support when we receive all information that actually identify where, how, and for what purposes payments have been made that were, that were not disclosed to us and that were kept off the books and not transparent. That's what we do. All right, we'll take a, a question from here. Thank you. Kwame Edudakwa, Ghana, Exim Bank. Exim Bank. Exim Bank. Madame Lagarde, Akwaba. Mesada. <laughs> Medasi. Medasi, sorry. sorry. You know, That's I'm, right. We we'll teach you. I was, we'll get, I was we'll always challenged. We we'll get you there, Midase. Midase. Um, given the nature of the, um, the institution, I, I um, am with, we have an international mandate. So my question is a bit justified. Now, John Bolton gave an Africa speech, and so I just want to know, given the leadership role of the U.S. in the IMF, what would, what was your opinion on that um, speech, if I may? And the second one is, a, um, I think you've part responded to that already, in terms of the, uh, because your global de um, debt database just came out, we can see increased um, levels of debt. Um, and my question really was that, do you think sub-Saharan African countries can maintain those levels of, uh, right. of debt? Now the voting speech, are you able to say exactly no, you know, it's, it, it's very easy because I'm not going to go into um, an adversarial uh, debate or controversy because I think it's, it's, it doesn't take the debate particularly far.